to Adam from the city. He's going to start us off today. Aloha, everyone, and welcome to the Homeless Veterans Virtual Conference. It's a statewide two-day homeless veterans conference. It may be uh, a little bit unusual, uh, as so many things are these days. Uh, things are, are so different, and I want to thank everyone in attendance today for being so flexible and being willing to try new things. This is a great way to meet, a safe way to meet, and a very important meeting. The theme for today and tomorrow is Serving Never Stops, Assisting Homeless Veterans During the Pandemic. We're all a little bit vulnerable during a pandemic, but none more, more so than our veterans. And uh, special attention needs to be paid to our heroes who were willing to sacrifice so much for this great country and didn't come back completely whole. So we want to uh, get started today, as Laura mentioned, that uh, if you get disconnected or anything, don't panic. You can just go right back to the conference webpage. And as she mentioned, that's honolulu.gov slash housing slash veterans slash HVVC. Feel free to write that down, but if you don't want to, you can just go to the housing web page and there's a link there where you can reconnect just as easily. Uh, so I wanted to get started today. Um, we are going to be on a tight schedule. I know that we have our uh, schedule online, which you can visit at the housing website. And you can try to keep track of that. I'd like to remind all of our attendees that you are muted and uh, your audio is off by default. However, we do want to encourage you all to participate in our Q&A section, which is on the bottom right of your screen. You can participate in the Q&A there that will be moderated. We'll be checking that out. So if you have any questions at any time, you can be heard that way. But we wanted to make sure that there isn't too much clutter. And I just wanted to rep remind our panelists and our speakers, when you're finished speaking, please be sure to mute afterwards as a courtesy to the other speakers. So without much further ado, I'd like to introduce one of our welcoming speakers today, our mayor, Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell. Now in 2015, Mayor Kirk Caldwell accepted the Mayor's Challenge, a national initiative of hundreds of mayors publicly committed to ending veteran homelessness. Since 2015, the homeless veteran population on Oahu has decreased by 24%, with 59% of people in shelter rather than on the street. Homelessness has long been a top priority of this administration, but a special focus has been paid to our heroes who were prepared to sacrifice everything for this country and return from combat not completely whole. Mayor Caldwell is a Waipahu boy. He previously served as the managing director of the city and county of Honolulu and represented the 24th representative district in the Hawaii State House of Representatives uh, of the Hawaii State Legislature from 2002 to 2008 and served as House Majority Leader between 2007 and 2008. Now, he is on his last 115 days serving as the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. And you can bet that he will be working every day, day and night, to make Honolulu a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you your mayor, Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell. Uh, aloha, folks. Good to see all of you. It's um, I really want to thank all of you for participating on this, um, you know, this Zoom kind of room conference call. I wish we could all be together in one large room in person because the issue of homelessness is about people and about helping those who really have a hard time helping themselves. And in this case, veterans, you know, who put on a uniform and put their life on the line for all of us defending our, our basic rights under our constitution. And there's no greater service than that. And they come home to places like Hawaii, to Honolulu, and some of them face challenges that they can't deal with all by themselves and they fall into homelessness. And I have to say as mayor, you know, I deal with homelessness on a daily basis. And um, when I'm moving around town, when I drive by someone now, not so much walking, but prior to the COVID-19 walking by, you know, there were, there would be homeless folks on the sidewalks. And I'd wonder, you know, could this have been someone who was wearing a uniform a year or two or even five years ago or going back to the Vietnam War, some cases even the Korean War, you know, how, and now they're here in this situation. And we owe it as American citizens to take care of those folks. And so a while ago now, I made a, a pledge, a commitment to, then First Lady Michelle Obama to end veterans homelessness in the city and county of Honolulu. And while we 
made great progress, we didn't get down to ending veterans homelessness. I do think those kind of goals help a lot in terms of, of, of working towards zero homelessness for veterans here on Oahu. And everything we do towards that direction is, is very positive. You know, Mark Alexander, who is, who is the point person for us here in the city and county of Honolulu, has led the charge ever since he arrived and has made great strides in terms of housing veterans who are homeless and finding houses for them. And there's many, many stories um, that, that can make your, your heart cry when you hear them describe their experience and then the hope and that outreached hand that is provided by the city. And so I'm glad today we're continuing to talk about this in next steps during a pandemic. You know, there are a lot of huge issues that we're dealing with on an international, national, state, and county level to deal with the pandemic. But we can't forget those who served who are homeless. And in fact, probably because of the pandemic, we're gonna see more veterans become homeless. And what do we do about it? How do we find out where they are immediately? And then how do we work with them to get them back into housing? And as mayor of the city and county of Honolulu, we've commit, we're committed to do that. While my administration is coming to an end, we continue to put in place programs that will live on way beyond our time here and be picked up by the next mayor and future councils to move us forward to a more compassionate place. You know, I end with this. I do think the state of Hawaii and city and county of Honolulu are places of great love and aloha. You know, they talk about ohana. And for us, ohana goes beyond our immediate family to our surrounding community, at the end of the day, to everyone who lives on this island and those who served in the military. And so our compassion needs to remain strong to help house people who served, and we're committed to do that. So I wanna thank you for gathering today, virtually, uh, to come together, to make sure we continue on that path, that climb, to end veterans homelessness, homelessness on the island of Oahu. Thank you so much. Mahalo and aloha, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor Caldwell. This is a uh, opening video from John Henry Felix, the executive chairman of the Hawaii Medical Assurance Association. I'm sure you're all very familiar. He's, uh, that's one of lar the largest health insurers in Hawaii, and he is the founding and current chair of the Homeless Veterans Task Force. He has a distinguished career in business, government, labor management, relations, community service, diplomacy, and education spanning six decades. He served as the chief of staff for the first governor of Hawaii, and President Reagan appointed him U.S. representative to the South Pacific Commission. He has chaired more than a dozen state and county boards and commissions and served for 16 years on the Honolulu City Council. A Menlo College alumnus, he holds two Oxford Masters of the Arts degrees from Harris Manchester College. And at Oxford, he is a fellow, vice president, and member of the congregation and the chancellor's court, is a retired business faculty member and a life member of the Oxford Union. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you John Henry Felix. Good morning. As chair of the VA's Homeless Veterans Task Force, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first virtual Veterans Health Summit sponsored by Mayor Caldwell's office. Special thanks is extended to Mark Alexander, who spearheaded this summit. Housing and good health go hand in hand in ensuring the well-being of our precious veterans. Our task force's model emphasizes this. One homeless veteran is one too many. Now, on with the conference. Mahalo noi loa for your participation. Aloha. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. At this time, I would like to introduce our opening plenary speaker who's going to be giving us a brief presentation on the national trends and the impact of COVID-19. Adam Riggi is the Deputy Director of Clinical Operations in the VHA Homeless Program Office and is responsible for overseeing operational planning and operational improvement throughout the VHA Homeless Programs. He has led a number of national initiatives for the Homeless Program Office over the past seven years, including the National Homeless Program Hiring Initiative, deployment of the Comprehensive Homeless Program's Performance Measurement System, and leading a team to support redesign of the Greater Los Angeles VA Healthcare System's Homeless Services Continuum, the largest in the VA system. Ladies and gentlemen, please pay close attention to Adam Rigney. Hey, 
Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. It is uh, a, truly a pleasure to uh, be able to uh, give this plenary uh, introduction speech and uh, share some of the insights that we've gained from the national office about the, um, about the pandemic. So I, I, as, uh, as, as was stated in, my, in the introduction here, uh, my name is Adam Reggie. I'm Deputy Director of Clinical Operations here within VHA Homeless Program Office. And I've worked for the uh, homeless programs in various, various roles for over 17 years, versus a homeless program outreach worker here in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm still based, um, uh, working with veterans, homeless veterans under the bridges and on the streets uh, and in the shelters in Columbus. Um, uh, for the last seven years, I've been working with VA homeless program offices and has been part, been part of the overall um, uh, efforts the VA and our federal partners, community partners, uh, have uh, undertaken to end veteran homelessness. Since the start of this pandemic, I've also been a part of the response team tasked to provide guidance and policy uh, related to the COVID-19 national emergency. Uh, I can tell you uh, I am so proud to be a VA employee. Uh, VA, as the largest integrated healthcare system in the nation, has uh, made some very difficult decisions to serve and, and, and good decisions to serve veterans during this pandemic. And I am ne I've never been more proud to be a VA employee, and especially a VA homeless program employee. So I'm going to be providing kind of this national perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic what VA did uh, in response to the crisis with a focus on the CARES Act. I wanna share some, some, uh, some uh, information about the CARES Act in the way forward as we see it. And again, I'm very honored to be uh, giving this uh, plenary today. So as you all very well know, we've made tremendous progress over the last 10 years. Homelessness among veterans has declined by nearly 50% since uh, 2010. And this was done through, you know, federal investment, integrated federal uh, planning and partnership, but most importantly, through the commitment of our, our local and state and community, uh, both governments and non-government organizations to ensure that veterans are, uh, you know, uh, assisted and taken off the street. Um, I think back to where we were when I started my career 17 years ago. And the response to this pandemic could have never have been happening. It could have never been as integrated or, or as much collaboration as, as what we're seeing now because we didn't have the systems in place. We didn't have all the people that needed in our communities in place with those relationships. And it, is, it has been a tremendous to see the amount of outpouring of support and collaboration and communication that has happened uh, since the start of this pandemic. So we've made this tremendous progress. 50% reduction, and then the pandemic strikes. So, so when CDC released that high-risk list of conditions uh, that uh, indicate a very high risk of serious complications from the, uh, the pandemic, I'm sorry, from the COVID-19 infection, we decided to take a look at our homeless veteran population. So uh, not only are we the largest uh, integrated healthcare system in the, in the nation, we have um, uh, the electronic medical record, largest electronic medical record, and we were able to identify pretty quickly that over 75% of the veterans that we were serving in VA homeless programs had at least one high-risk condition that would, would present um, a high, you know, high uh, uh, likelihood of a serious complication because of the COVID-19 uh, infection. So 75% of veterans had at least one, and, and many had and multiple. We had also heard early on reports about asymptomatic infections occurring in homeless shelters, especially in some of the hotspot areas in New York and in Massachusetts. But some of the early studies indicated that up to upwards of 75% of homeless individuals had tested positive for COVID-19 uh, in shelters and congregate living environments, yet had not, um, uh, had, not had symptoms. And uh, combining that, the asymptomatic carriers with the high risk of veterans that we serve, we had to take decisive action to, uh, to ensure safety of veterans that, that you know, ensure safety of homeless veterans in our programs. During that time, we had also heard that uh, public housing authorities were starting to shut down. And some of our, one of our most essential programs uh, to, uh, to ending veteran homelessness, the hud Bash program, was no longer able to uh, get vouchers out in the hands of veterans. 
which uh, caused uh, a major disruption to our, our services at the VA and in the community. Uh, we know that the economic impacts uh, of, of this pandemic will, will continue for years. And we know that it's, it's, it happened pretty quickly for veterans, uh, especially those who, who had, uh, you know, who, who were at risk of, of losing their homes. So we, we had heard that veterans, many veterans were losing their jobs. It just increases the likelihood of them coming into homelessness. And additionally, VA medical centers, uh, because of the, uh, the risk of, of patients in VA, um, they started to see veterans uh, uh, through virtual modalities. So they were no longer able to see veterans face to face, which of course um, uh, was, uh, you know, it was very challenging for, for our homeless veterans because they don't have the technology. Many of them do not have the technology, be that tablets or smartphones or, or computers to be able to, to engage their, uh, their, um, their providers and their healthcare providers to, uh, to get the care that they need. So recognizing the, the, what would be considered an existential crisis for our, for our, for our homeless veterans, uh, we, as well as our federal partners in, in every community uh, across, the, uh, across the nation, uh, together responded. And uh, we developed a plan to help support uh, uh, veterans during this time. First part of this plan was removing uh, any kind of programmatic and policy barriers that impact our program's ability to immediately respond to the pandemic. We scoured every single um, opportunity. We identified every opportunity we could to lift any kind of restrictions or policies that would be prohibitive to serving, you know, veterans to get them in safe and safe uh, housing. One example of this is the expansion of our uh, uh, of grant per diem or transitional housing programs, and then our SSVF program to place veterans into hotels and motels, which was which has been tremendous. It's been a tremendous. Um, a way to get veterans out of congregate living environments and out of unsheltered environments into safe apartments where there, there are rooms. Um, uh, second, uh, we've been rapidly increasing emergency housing and eviction prevention efforts by expanding services and resources through the CARES Act. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, here, here in a little bit. But this, you know, this has been a tremendous uh, uh, a resource that we've been able to, to allocate nationally to help support veterans during this time. Third, also providing intensive technical assistance uh, to both our, uh, our VA homeless program staff and our community providers. Fourth, developing and executing a universal testing protocol for veterans in our uh, VA funded congregate living environments. I'll speak to that in a little bit. Um, a fifth uh, part of this plan, uh, expanding our ability to provide virtual care to homeless veterans by securing resources to provide needed technology. And that's the smartphones. Uh, and, and CARES Act funding is allowing us to do that. I'll speak to that as well. And then six, ensuring that there is a coordinated federal response by ensuring that our plan, that our plan to uh, respond and address this uh, pandemic for homeless veterans is coordinated with our federal, federal partners. Uh, this continues to evolve as we learn more about the science behind this and the impact, both the economic impact, the healthcare impact of, uh, of this pandemic on veterans. This will continue to evolve and will continue to be very flexible in our response. So the CARES Act, when it was, um, when it was passed, offered us unprecedented funding and flexibility to support homeless veterans. Um, in this, in this incredibly partisan environment that we've, you know, that we all know about over the last few years, the one thing that seems to be bringing our uh, our, our different Cong Congress people and uh, and senators together is uh, homeless veterans. We have received bipartisan support uh, throughout, um, you know, throughout a number of years, going back to 2008 when we started receiving funding for homeless services. And every year we see an increase of, of funding for homeless veteran programs. In fact, this year alone in 2020, FY 2020, we received $1.4 billion in earmarked funds from Congress to support homeless veterans. The CARES Act has allocated, allowed us to use $700 million additional dollars to support homeless, support homeless veterans during the crisis. It's done three things. First, it's waived the authorization caps for SSVF. If you didn't know this, 
SSBF was capped at $300 million a year. Through the CARES Act, we were able to um, uh, uh, obtain enough resources and funding. We've, we've obtained over $600 million in additional funding on top of the $300 million to help support uh, our communities and our veterans in four different ways. One, to uh, provide emergency housing to reduce the COVID transmission risks. And, and to give you a sense of what impact that's made through August, uh, from, from about April to August, nearly 12,000 veterans and family members have been moved into hotels and motels off the streets and, and out of shelters. Second, this funding is being used to help support our uh, VA medical centers uh, as well. And um, uh, in, in terms of HUD VASH, as I mentioned in my uh, introductory statements, uh, HUD VASH has been dramatically impacted by this, by, by public housing authorities not being able to issue vouchers. And SSVF is stepping up to help support our medical centers to, uh, to, to release HUD VASH vouchers to get them in the hands of veterans in the housing. There's a lot more work to be done here. We're still, we don't see the, the number of housing placements that we would like, but we are definitely on the right track. Third, the additional $600 million in additional SSVF funding has enhanced prevention services to avoid the anticipated wave of evictions. Uh, we want to prevent veterans from, from becoming homeless in the first place. And then fourth, this additional funding is being able to use to um, uh, fund healthcare navigator positions through the SSVF program. Knowing that, that homeless veterans, especially if they're isolated and quarantined, much like, like any of us, are going to experience an exacerbation of mental health and substance abuse uh, disorder symptoms. And these navigators will help support those veterans in that program to be able to um, uh, access needed VA, healthcare, and community healthcare services. The second thing that the, uh, the CARES Act has done, it actually requires VA to ensure that telehealth capabilities are available during this public health emergency for case managers and veterans in the hud -Bash program. And over $17 million has been allocated to increase capacity uh, by expanding telehealth for, for, for homeless veterans. Uh, we, you know, we knew when we went to virtual care, we had to get the, the technology, um, uh, technology in the hands of veterans so they can stay connected, not only with their healthcare providers, but with their caregivers and their social support. And as of uh, last week, approximately 9,000 phones have been shipped to over 70 medical centers for immediate dissemination to veterans with the greatest need. And we, our office, in, in working with um, uh, National Contracting Office in the VA, is working on the contracting effort to um, expedite the next phase of this effort, which will include a substantially larger procure, procurement of, of uh, smartphones to, uh, to make sure that every medical center has the smartphones that they need to give the veterans to stay, so that they stay connected. Third thing that the uh, CARES Act did is it allowed the grant per diem program, our transitional housing program, it, it lifted the caps on per diem payments so that our grant per diem uh, providers can uh, uh, safely serve veterans during this time. And that includes, uh, you know, increasing the per diem rate so that uh, veterans can be placed in hotels or motels uh, to uh, buy the needed cleaning supplies or, or additional staffing resources to make sure that veterans in those programs are safe and physically distant. And as of uh, middle of August, uh, the grant per diem progr program has approved over 400 uh, per, diem increase, per diem increases, averaging about $30, uh, $30 per bed per day. This will continue to help support our overall, overall strategy to make sure that our community partners have the resources that they need to keep veterans safe. So the way forward, um, you know, it, it seems sometimes that, um, you know, we've been in this pandemic for about six months. And it's actually, it feels much longer than that, as many of you I'm sure can share. And, but we also wanna recognize that this is early on. We're still early on in this. And we see that this is only the start. And the more we learn about this disease, this pandemic, the more we learn about uh, the economic impact, um, the more we will adjust our strategy, the more we will advocate for additional flexibilities and funding needed to support homeless veterans. So our top priorities moving forward from the, the VA, VA Homeless Program Office, we will continue to work with uh, Congress, our, our national uh, partners, and our local and community stakeholders to identify the flexibilities needed to support uh, homeless veterans. 
I do want to just state that there is a bill currently in Congress called the Homeless Veterans Coronavirus Act of 2020 that would actually provide unprecedented flexibility to the VA to support homeless veterans, which would include the, giving us the ability to provide food, transportation, and shelter directly to homeless veterans. Second, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've executed a testing protocol for veterans in VA-funded congregate living environments. And what this, what this is, this policy requires regular COVID-19 testing for veterans in these programs, in our grant per diem, healthcare for homeless veterans contract residential programs to ensure that um, uh, veterans, when they're identified as, as have been positive for COVID-19, that they can be quickly isolated and quarantined so that we don't have major outbreaks. VA medical centers are currently uh, uh, um, currently planning and implementing this, uh, this protocol. We're very excited to have this uh, protocol in place. Third, uh, third strategy moving forward, increasing staffing levels throughout the nation, especially for the HUD-VASH program, to ensure that VA has a workforce needed to support homeless veterans during this crisis. Um, uh, even though we've, many of our staff have gone uh, you know, virtual, more now than ever, do we need the staffing resources at the VA to ensure those veterans receive the care that they, that they need? And we are continuing to uh, uh, work with medical centers and uh, our networks to ensure that our, our medical centers have the staffing resources needed to serve homeless veterans. Fourth, and I, I want you know, the attendees to consider this, strongly consider this. When I mentioned uh, you know, the SSVF program moving so many veterans from uh, shelter situations on shelter, from homelessness into uh, motels and hotels, we see this as an opportunity. We see this as an opportunity to get those veterans out of those hotels and instead of back into homelessness, back into permanent housing. So we really want to focus on uh, focus on having, uh, you know, moving veterans from hotels, motels, and other emergency housing situations into permanent housing. I know this will require quite a bit of um, uh, coordination and collaboration with the community and the VA, but we cannot reinforce this more. This is our opportunity to get those veterans off the streets, out of the shelters, and into permanent housing. And then fifth, we are going to continue to evaluate the lessons learned from this, uh, from this, um, uh, from this, uh, from this crisis. And based on that, based on the different lessons learned, we want to look at what we can maintain, not just during the public health crisis, but what we can maintain for the long term. Because there's many things that we that have been implemented by communities, by by our, us and the VA and our federal partners that could be considered best practices and getting veterans off the street. So I just want to say thank you uh, to the mayor's office, Mayor Caldwell, and everybody that's been involved in the development of this uh, virtual conference. I want to thank the local VA Medical Center and, and, and the new director, members of the Homeless Veterans Task Force, including John Henry Felix, who, as I understand, has been hugely supportive of this effort. And everybody's been, everybody else has been involved in the development of this virtual training. Partnerships, collaboration, flexibility will continue to be the key to, during these times as we, we all work towards keeping veterans safe and, and even more importantly, ending veteran homelessness in our communities. So coming from a, uh, somebody who was uh, born and raised in the Midwest and continue to live there, I hope I don't mangle this too much, a, a giant mahalo to everybody for attending and for all of your work in, in serving veterans and, and towards our mission towards ending veteran homelessness. Thank you, Adam. This is a fantastic report. We have eight minutes for question and answer, then we're going to take a quick break before going into our first uh, panelist section. So, Adam, we have some questions for you, uh, and we're going to start with uh, our uh, first question here. How can supportive services for veteran families, families SSVF funding, help veterans obtain hud dash vouchers? That's a, that's a great question. So um, uh, early on in this uh, pandemic, uh, our national offices, the SSVF and HUD-VASH program offices, worked together to devise strategies to work, you know, work towards uh, getting veterans HUD-VASH vouchers. And so um, quite a bit of that has involved, uh, you know, using an example here, using SSVF funds to place a veteran in, a, in an emergency, like an apartment, while they wait for their HUD bash voucher so that they could use that voucher in that apartment. Uh, we know a number of communities have done that. We've also seen uh, SSVF provide uh, quite a bit of um, uh, uh, care management services and case management services in addition to HUD bash. And so there's been a tremendous amount of collaboration between the two programs. The additional financial assistance that SSVF has been able to, to provide 
has not only helped veterans get into HUD VASH apartments, but for those veterans who are in HUD VASH who may be at risk of losing their homelessness, they've been able to use prevention funds to support those veterans. Thanks, Adam. Are we looking at stabilization beds as a way to assist veterans during the pandemic? So I'm, I'm not quite sure if I, if, I, if I understand stabilization beds, but I, I, the term stabilization beds in this context. But I can tell you that uh, you know, our, our grant per diem transitional housing program continues to uh, operate. It, it continues to you know, place veterans, remove veterans from sh the shelters and the streets into those, uh, into those programs. One thing I failed to mention earlier um, that, I, that, I, that I'd forgotten about is that um, the Healthcare for Homeless Veterans Contract Residential Program. So this is a, a locally contracted program uh, that allows the VA to contract with community providers. That program received $10 million in additional funding through the CARES Act. And this, uh, this is a way to kind of expand the um, kind of the, uh, the, the number of beds that we need for those veterans who can't get into SSVF for whatever reason, for those veterans who can't get into our existing grant per diem programs, the HHV contract program has um, uh, been able to uh, support, you know, by expanding our footprint there, support more veterans and getting them into beds. Is there any pending VACO approval for COVID-19 testing and medical support for veterans who are not VA healthcare eligible? This is a, this is a great question. And uh, we wanna acknowledge that, um, especially our SSVF program, specifically our SSVF program and grant per diem program are able, able to serve veterans who are not eligible for VA healthcare. And so um, we've been working with our, our national offices to identify options for those veterans. And, and I mentioned earlier, the SSVF uh, healthcare navigator positions will help support that. Um, the, the, uh, the grant per diem program office is uh, going to be messaging out. There's actually going to be a webinar that's going to be made available to all grant per diem providers that will allow grant per diem providers to uh, ask for per diem increases to account for the um, uh, the ineligible veterans so that they could get the funding to get those veterans tested. So there's a number of different strategies that we're, we're looking at here and just want to acknowledge that this still remains you know, a challenging issue because upwards of 15 percent of veterans served by some of our programs are not eligible for VA health care. Uh, what are some silver linings, if there are any right now, regarding access to housing? Um, this, is a, this, this, is a, 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 this is a difficult question. And the one, the one silver lining that I can share is, um, you know, what we're seeing both at the national level and at the local level are, you know, our national programs banding together uh, but, but even more importantly, our community programs banding together to come up with, with uh, innovative solutions to help support, you know, access to housing. Uh, we know that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, that collaboration between the SSVF and the HUD-VASH HUD program, um, that is something that has, has not necessarily existed in the national level and is, is now, you know, stronger than ever. And so, you know, some of the silver linings, it's, it's required uh, multiple different people, multiple different leaders at both the national and community level to get at the table to come up with innovative solutions to help support our veterans. How many of the flexible changes to programs may continue after COVID given the early successes? That's a great question and something that we're going to continue to evaluate and we want to hear from, we want to hear from the community what has worked, what has worked for the local VA, what has worked for the community. What are some of these flexibilities that we need to be advocating for uh, to continue after after the pandemic? Uh, so, you know, we're still evaluating that and uh, um, uh, your feedback will be essential as we make those determinations. We might have time for uh, one or two more questions. So I'd, I'd ask anybody who has questions, please use the Q&A portion on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, send a, a Q&A question and I will read it aloud. Um, can you foresee a dip in resources two years down the road after the crisis of COVID is complete? We are flushing money right now, but the budgets are probably going to be cut down the road. I, you know, I, I can't really speak what's going to happen um, uh, post COVID. I, I think it's going to be very difficult for um, any of us to really predict what, 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 what all this will look like uh, post COVID-19. What I can say 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, that there's been incredibly strong bipartisan support for homeless programs. Um, uh, in fact, is next year for, for fiscal year 21, we're anticipating an even uh, a bigger increase with our base funding. So, so homeless programs continue to receive strong support from Congress and, and, and our national leaders. Um, be able to uh, predict what might happen two years from now. Fortunately, uh, I don't know, and I, I'm not sure that um, I'd want to venture a guess, to be quite honest. Okay, I have a quick question from Zach Wattopper. I'm going to uh, have Laura unmute them briefly. Good morning, and thank you for this presentation. Now, in Columbus is where you physically are right now? That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, what trends do you see? Homeless veterans wise. So when we when we think about um, kind of this national perspective um, uh, and the trends that we're seeing, you know, across the system, is that you know over the last ten years we've seen the biggest reductions in communities that don't have the rising housing costs. And um, uh, when you look at, at some of the increases along the West Coast. Uh, especially in the West Coast um, and some of our higher cost communities, we're seeing increases in, in, in homelessness. So kind of thinking, thinking about that, you know, answering that question from kind of a national perspective, we're just seeing huge increases in some of our uh, uh, larger communities and high cost communities. When, when we think about veterans at the kind of at the individual level, uh, you know, average age of veterans served by, by our programs is about 55 or 56 years old, multiple comorbidities. comorbidities. Research indicates that, you know, for any, any homeless individuals, um, you add about 15 years to that. So we're, 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 what we see here is a kind of a, a, a wave. We're, we're seeing a wave of veterans experiencing homelessness with, you know, uh, with diseases and, and conditions that would be typically seen uh, among uh, individuals who are much older. So that, that, that requires us to kind of change focus a bit and will continue to require us to change focus a bit on how we provide services to homeless veterans. Thank you, Adam. That's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank you so much for everything that you're doing uh, and of course for everyone who's participating, but thank you so much for the excellent, uh, the excellent remarks and the great uh, questions being answered. I would like to, at this time, uh, let everyone know that we're going to have a five-minute break, but at 9.45, we're going to be going into our first breakout sessions. Uh, so please go to the honolulu.gov slash housing slash veterans slash HVVC to find the breakout session that most appeals to you. We have special needs for women and gender expansive veterans, suicide prevention 2.0 from the clinic to community, and being data-driven evidence as guidance. So we have excellent breakout sessions for everyone to participate in. Please find the one that works best for you. Those are gonna be starting at 9.45 to 10.30, and there will be a brief break, then we'll have the second breakout session right after that. The agenda, of course, can be found at honolulu.gov slash housing slash veterans slash HVVC. And I look forward to seeing you all back here at 11.30 for the closing plenary. Thank you all so much for participating in today's event. Aloha, and I'll see you guys at 11.30.